Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Whoa, here it is tonight in Northern California, Berkeley, California. My name is G and Noel with us here helping out tonight on Apex. We're going to look at a segment a little bit about Buy America or Backlash and the Asian American, uh, I was going to say Jazz Festival, the Asian American Film Festival. There's so many Asian American festivals these days. The international one is happening and it highlights what's happening throughout the Asian American and South Asian diaspora. And we're going to have a little bit about that. Jeff Adachi will be talking with him. He is, yes, the San Francisco public defender who also does documentaries. And he takes some time out to look at the first TV Asian American hipster, Jack Sue. And my friend Y.E. here. Hello. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm good. I'm back. Good to be back board on Apex Express. Back in the saddle. What's up with that? I know that you have some young filmmaker we're going to be talking about, too. Yeah, we'll be talking with the winner of the People's Choice Award, um, the director, Matthew Abaya, who won um, the Do It Yourself video contest presented by Locust Arts. Kearney Street Workshop in the San Francisco International Film Festival. Right, I think you got 40,000 hits or something. Yeah. On <laughs> okay, so well, that's going to be happening. But first up, we want to talk a little bit about this Buy American provision of the American Recovery Act. Does it help U.S. industry? And also, however, does it dovetail into a history of backlash against Asian Americans? And with us tonight is union and community organizer. Uh, Mr. Warren Marr. He is also um, a member of the faculty at uh, San Francisco Community College in the Labor Studies, and he has also been in, in the organizing department of the AFL-CIO. Welcome to the show, Warren. How are you doing? Good evening, Jenna. Thanks for having me. You know, I want to just kind of open up a little bit about this American Recovery Act, which, uh, you know, it's been um, kind of a it's been on, it's been on a highlight, I think. And one of the main things about this this package that provision, the American Recovery Act, was that uh, it's about uh, over seven hundred and eighty billion dollars. And within it, um, all companies that benefit from the stimulus package must buy um, made in America products such as steel and some manufactured goods. Now, there are some exemptions. Uh, for example, um, Mexico and Canada are exempted. I believe some of the EU, European Union is, ex- is also exempted. But um, some other countries, uh, very large developing countries, um, Brazil, uh, Russia, and India and China, they they are part of this uh, exemption. I mean, you're not supposed to be buying steel from these countries. You're not supposed to be buying products from these countries if you benefit from from this stimulus package. Now, in the past, it's it's created some some tensions in the United States. It sort of dovetailed into some of the Asian American anti Asian American sentiment. So, um, Warren. You have been longtime union man, um, you know, and uh, I know that the unions seem to have supported this uh, Buy American provision. I want to ask you, though, what, what is it about this? What, what has been the union's view, and d- does it have any relationship to the Asian American community? Have they taken that into the equation? Well, Jenna, as we spoke a little bit about before the show started, this is not a new thing. Um, this Buy America campaign or different Buy America campaigns, you know, started way back in the 30s. You know, Hearst played a big role in it in the 50s. And there's been a lot of... It really took a, a, a kind of a spike in the 70s um, because, um, you know, American uh, corporations were no no longer dominating the globe uh, after World War II. So it's kind of a very kind of a sad chapter in the U.S. history. Um, and... Another thing is that you're right about the anti-Asian violence or the anti-Asian sentiments it has, you know, expressed because, you know, I think a lot of our listeners might remember 1982 when two auto workers killed a Chinese man, Vincent Chin, uh, at the height of one of the Buy American campaigns, uh, mainly organized by the United Auto Workers. Um, they killed him in a bar 
uh, because they started a verbal attack on him for taking their jobs, mainly because they mistook him for a Japanese American, but he was Chinese American. And, you know, a fight ensued. They chased him out of the bar and they killed him. And the really sad thing, it was in Detroit where he lived. And actually, they killed him in a restaurant in, in front of about 50 eyewitnesses. Um, and I think the uh, thing that we really remember is that nobody came out and helped him. And the other thing is uh, the guys actually got let off pretty lightly um, after that assault. Now, this time with Obama as president, um, and there doesn't seem to be as much, in my opinion, I could be wrong, of the danger of this you know, tipping over into this narrow nationalism, ultra-patriotic thing. But on the other hand, there is this fear of China and India and, you know, the kind of thing about China um, goods and how the U.S. is, um, there's a big trade imbalance. But in your opinion, you, you're very familiar with the union. You've worked in Asian American communities. Do you feel that this, with Obama being president, there's not going to be the same kind of hysteria that there was back in the 80s with the, the Japanese autos and how that became such a big issue? I don't, I don't think there is going to be that hysteria because, first of all, um, the unions are split on the issue. And also, uh, I think the sad thing is the unions are not really addressing the issue, which is that the corporations are global and, unfortunately, the working class is not. And I think the the unions need to go away from this kind of nationalism uh by siding with their employers and look at how they could have more solidarity with workers from other parts of the world. So that's one of the uh, problems. But th it, there isn't unity on it. There's not unity uh, from the corporate uh, side. There's neither unity on the union side because a lot less unions are engaged in manufacturing. A lot more unions are engaged in service and also a lot of unions are also engaged in import-export like the Teamsters, like the Longshoremen. And their jobs are dependent upon uh, trade. So the, the Teamsters and the Longshoremen have come out against the Buy American provision? I don't know if they're, they've come out against it, but they're definitely not for it. I mean, I don't think they're promoting it. So that's one of the things, you know. I think the steel workers, um, it's kind of, in a way, very sad what has happened to the steel industry in this country and actually it's very complicated it might take longer than this show has but one of the things uh, I had mentioned uh, again before the show started one of the big promoters of uh, Buy American Steel was actually on PBS uh, a couple of weeks ago and if people google it I'm sure they could find that show um, and he was very in support of buying American steel now the ironic thing was that all his mini steel mills were in the south and they were all non-union. And he was clearly an anti-union uh, steel capitalist. And, and he was very proud of the fact that one of the reasons he was manufacturing steel in the United States and doing it well was because he was non-union. So I think this is a very big dilemma for the United Steel workers. Well, actually, uh, a lot of American businesses came out for, uh, uh, rather against, by America because, you know, the way products are made these days, you know, how do you get a tag buy in America when the final product hits the shelves? Right. And the, and the really sad thing is some of the Amer buy American tags that are buy American baseball caps that are buy American T-shirts I've seen have been made in China. So that was that's a whole nother, uh, you know, cr crazy twist to this whole story. But um, again, I don't want to side with either employer because I, I think that is the dilemma, the the. the the, I think the unions and the working class, the, it's not in their interest to side with the steel corporations, or nor is it in their in their interest to side with Walmart, who wants to import everything uh, and, and have that race to the bottom. So I think the real question, I think, facing unions and facing working people in this country is what's in their best interest. And it is not in their best interest to side with their bosses, which is what the UAW did, the United Auto Workers did in the 60s and 70s, and hoping that, well, there used to be a real famous quote, what was good for GM is good for, for America. And now that GM is in the toilet, obviously, it's not so good for the United Auto Workers. But, but that was one of the famous quote from one of their union officers. And I think that that is a problem. Um, you have a, a story a little bit because uh, I, I, I've asked the question to a lot of people. How do they determine how you get a made in America tag? Because so many parts, like car parts, are made, you know, they're, they're made. Technology is, is global, too. 
So, you know, how how have you come across that in your dealings with, you know? A- absolutely. And this was a, a, a little discussion uh, we had uh, before I walked into the studio. As, as you mentioned, I used to be an organizer with the AFL-CIO. Well, the AFL-CIO had a policy that, first of all, you can't park an import in their parking lot but since I never drove to Washington DC anyway that wasn't a problem but they uh, I did a lot of most of my work was for the AFL CIO and as a union organizer I probably drove 200 miles on my car and I had a Toyota Corolla a 1995 Toyota Corolla and the AFL CIO sent me a letter and they said they would not it, reimbursed me for my gas mileage for my Toyota Corolla because it was not made in America. And I said, wait a minute. I bought this car. I know exactly where it's made. It's made in Fremont, California, which is the only auto plant left in our state of California, a joint venture between Toyota and General Motors. And it is also a United Auto Workers unionized plant because I had that sticker or that metal tag on my door. And I threatened them to cut it off and send it to them. But I, luckily, I didn't have to do that. They did reimburse me <laughs> for my mileage after I proved to them through the uh, numbers on the car that, in fact, they checked with the UAW, and, in fact, it was a union-made car in California. We're going to get back to this uh, issue and also talk about some ideas, uh, Warren, that you might have about what labor could do to improve the situation and uh, some other ideas around this Buy America versus a backlash kind of issue uh, right after this important message. So stay tuned to Apex Express right here on KPFA and KPFB. <laughs> This is a listing of upcoming events in the Bay Area for the week ending March 22nd. All events are wheelchair accessible. Please listen closely for contact numbers. On Friday, March 20th, from 2 to 4 p.m., the Berkeley East Bay Gray Panthers are hosting a rally for peace and a cry to bring troops home now. This event will take place on the corners of Acton and University Avenue in Berkeley. For details, call 510-841-4143. On Wednesday, March 18th at 7.30 p.m., the Humanist Hall will host Trashed, a documentary about the garbage industry by Grant Williams. This event takes place at 390 27th Street in Oakland, $5 donation. For details, visit humanisthall.org or call 510-451-5818. On Thursday, March 19th, from 6 to 7 p.m., the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center is sponsoring a peace vigil with speakers and information distribution. This event will commemorate the sixth anniversary of the tragic Iraq War. This free event takes place at Lytton Plaza on the corners of University Ave and Emerson Street in Palo Alto. For details, call 650-326-8837. The community calendar is produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA Box 51, 1929, Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Fax them to 510-848-3812 or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Attention to the community calendar. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. This calendar is also online at kpfa.org. And welcome back. This is Apex Express right here on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, and online at www.kpfa.org. The time is 7.13. My name is G, and with me in the studio is Warren Marr, labor and community activist. We are talking about the Buy American provision in the American Recovery Act and if there's any issue or any possibility of a backlash. And uh, for Asian American communities, a lot of times these kind of issues do result in anti-Asian sentiment. So we're gonna we're trying to get into this a little bit more. It's a complex issue and Warren um, has been very uh, involved in it through the years especially on the union side and speaking of which um, you you had mentioned earlier Warren that the unions had been um, very divided on this by American issue because oftentimes people like the Teamsters etc are um, um, very caught up in in global trade so there's a division in in the labor unions what do you think the union is going to do about a situation like this Well, I think it is a valid question about how do we save good American jobs? How do we save and also a living standard for workers, which, by the way, the United Auto Workers have just 
taken an incredible uh, wage cut in their latest contract, you know, after um, the, UAW? The, pro- the UAW with the problems. I mean, now a starting UAW person can make $14 an hour. And we know by any standard, uh, even with restaurant workers, that's not a great wage. Uh, and it's not a living wage uh, in the United States these days uh, for a family. So, you know, um, the unions have really uh, been hurt. Uh, more than anybody uh, by this uh, economic downturn. And I think working people have been hurt more than anybody uh, with this economic downturn. And this downturn was caused by the uh, corporations. It was caused by a lot of greed, you know, which I think uh, other people at KPFA have talked about much more than Mm -hmm. I can today. So the question really is, what should workers do? What should the workers be demanding from the government, the Obama administration, but as well Congress, what should they demand uh, in terms of a safety net, in terms of job retraining if they do get laid off, in terms of uh, a living wage if they have to take another job? So these are all uh, serious questions, but these are questions that the unions did not deal with. So I just wanted to go back because a little bit because the UAW in the past had the ability to bargain with the employers about what kind of cars they would make or the quality of the cars they would make, they gave this all up in the 1950s. That's not ancient history. I mean, that's maybe recent history for some of us on the older side. But I think that they gave that all up for great wages, great benefits, and great working conditions. And they did. They got into the middle class in the 50s and the early 60s, which was kind of like the the heyday of American labor, although not so great for people of color. But look what happened now. They relied on that because of the growth of GM and Ford. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a real lesson for American workers. They cannot tie themselves to their bosses. Why, you got something to add on or ask? Yeah, I mean, just speaking from like a younger generation, I've I've seen the Buy American signs, you know, come up after 9-11. And, um, you know, the American flags and, you know, just the irony I was thinking of, you know, a lot of the um, American flags were made in China. And, um, you know, right now you have a lot of job loss, like you mentioned. And um, with this um, recovery plan, you know, how are people to spend or buy when they're they're They don't have any jobs. You know, they're um, barely surviving for most people. And how how does this how is this plan going to help people? Yeah, I I think there's been a lot of bizarre corporate campaigns. I mean, I think the the campaign after 9/11 was especially sad because it wasn't even just buy American; it was just go shopping, which mm-hmm. is that's our response to a tragedy. I mean, yeah, uh, it didn't make sense. So it it is a very yes, it was a very uh, strange uh, corporate campaign. Unfortunately, uh, you know, some people bought into it. I don't think too many KPFA listeners bought into it, but. Um, you know, I think that that is one of the uh, sad things that happen is is that it is what I think what's facing all American workers right now and all Americans right now is is what's good for the corporations, good for the workers. And I think that if the unions, whether you're in a union or not, I think our answer has to be no. <laughs> you know, and that's true whether you work at GM and it's true whether you work at Safeway and it's true whether you work in a hospital. Mm-hmm. I think is not necessarily true. What is good for Safeway is good for the you as a worker at Safeway, nor is it good for the people in the community to have to buy their food at Safeway. So I think those are new issues that uh, I think the working class has to deal with. Mm-hmm. In this uh, Buy America uh, provision of the American Recovery Act, um, Mexico is is exempt, uh, Canada is exempt for that, based on, I think, some union ties, right, that were made with, with the unions here. Yeah, you know, Neil, and this is, again, uh, it's a very particular thing about North American, uh, or I should just say Anglo-American chauvinism, because, you know, Canada and the U.S. has always been kind of, looked at as the world and you know i was kind of joking before the show it's just like when we call the baseball game the world series you know and the only people playing are people in the united states um you know it's the same thing when we call about international unions the the way americans define international unions is canada and the u.s you know well there's a lot of other unions beyond uh, international unions. And the sad thing is maybe the Japanese auto workers probably today are more organized than the UAW. 
They probably have more unionized plants percentage-wise than the United Auto Workers within the boundaries of the United States. So that's something that American workers really have to think about. Uh, just to kind of wrap this up now, um, China and India. Uh, in China, what what is the union situation like? Is there any possibility of, has there been any contact between American unions and the unions in China? I think it's getting better. Um, I can't say, you know, they're obviously... Uh, the Chinese government, there's a lot of issues there. You know, they're not exactly labor friendly any more than the U.S. government is. But I think, uh, I think American unions, a lot of them are a lot more open to contact. And I think that the Cold War, uh, um, aspect of, uh, only recognizing unions that were pro American or anti communist, I think that's gone. That's, that's, that's pretty much gone. Um, so I think that things have changed, but I just want to point out to the listeners that there's always going to be a new, uh, bad person. And I don't know, I don't want to use a politically incorrect term, but there's always going to be, you know, somebody we shouldn't work with, deal with, or buy from. Uh, I think in the eighties, it was Japan. They were the big, you know, uh, threat on the block. And today is China. And then maybe later in the horizon, it could be India and Brazil. But I think really the other hard question American workers have to deal with is that the question of the rise of the global south, which is the um, the workers that what we used to call the third world. You know, we we can't uh, tell them they cannot industrialize. Yeah. We cannot tell them they cannot try to raise their standard of living. And that's what they're doing in China. That's what they're doing in India. That's what they're doing in Brazil. Before we wrap this up, do you have any contact numbers or any references that uh, people might want to look up? Yes, definitely. Um, first of all, I think still uh, one of the uh, primary uh, things people should read if they're interested in the Buy American campaigns or the history of these campaigns is a book by Dana Frank put out by uh, Beacon Press. And I would also uh, encourage people to Google um, or look up on the web anything by uh, Jeremy Brechter. And there's been also a lot of web pages on the uh, struggles in the global south. And a lot of those also uh, deal with this question of globalization and also the American corporations that, that are going into their countries, which is another aspect that this by American things. Corporations also are building in those countries. Okay. Um, we're going to be continuing on with this global discussion, but in a little bit lighter, happier tip because the Asian American Film Festival grabs all these folks work from throughout the globe, director, actor, documentarians, and from going to this wonderful film festival that actually opens tonight and always opens tonight when we are sitting here on Apex Express. And they really, uh, it gives a good insight into what's going on in the world through the Asian American Film Festival. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that in a bit. Jeff Badachi has a film, and we're going to also speak to the winner of one of the film's um, contests. But first, I want to play some music. That is from a Hollywood, rather Bollywood movie from India. So with the success of Slumdog Millionaire and the Bollywood music is so influential throughout the world now, this is called From the Streets of Bollywood. And then we'll get right back into it. This is Apex Express. <laughs>
producer's call, Suite of Bollywood and Beyond. This particular track is from the film Bluff Master and Bazi. Bluff Master and Bazi. And it's done by Samir Udin. And again, Streets of Bollywood and Beyond here on Apex Express. We are going to go into a little preview of a film about an uncompromising actor and the first Asian American TV hipster. So stay tuned in just a minute. San Francisco's public defender. As it turns out, he is also a documentary filmmaker, and he is eager to introduce you to his new subject, the late entertainer and comedian, Jack Su, a.k.a. Goro Suzuki. In his most recent documentary, You Don't Know Jack, the Jack Su story. Jack Su was famous for his roles in the Broadway hit and movie Flower Drum Song, and for his detective Yamana character on the popular 70s show Barney Miller. Jack Su was actually born on a ship going back to Japan. His family was here in Oakland, and they decided that uh, they wanted to have their f firstborn son born in Japan. So, you know, his mother and father jumped on a ship, I guess, back to Japan, and that's where uh, he was born, halfway there. And uh, he uh, grew up in, in Oakland, California, and he um, went to Oakland Tech High School, and uh, just as as he was sort of getting on his feet, he uh, uh, the um, internment order came down, and so uh, he and his family uh, uh, were uh, placed at the Tafaran Assembly Center. And he was an entertainer in in camp. I mean, when you think about the camp experience, I mean, from what our parents and grandparents told us, I mean, it was a very very difficult time, and. Um, there was nothing to do, particularly in the beginning. Um, and so Jack Su, uh, I mean, uh, and so uh, Goto Suzuki, as he was known then, uh, began putting together shows in the camps. And these shows, from what I understand, uh, were very uh, well done and sophisticated shows. And they, they had nothing, I mean, to produce these shows with. But they somehow pulled it together, and they did it. And these are, you know, full-fledged uh, variety shows, plays. And I was just uh, fascinated that they were able to, to do this in the spite of, in spite of the war, in spite of the internment. He was eventually uh, moved to uh, Topaz. Goto Suzuki was in Topaz at the internment camps there, and he. Uh, was uh, uh, there for you know probably six or seven months, entertained there, and then uh, went to Cleveland, Ohio, because if they were able to uh, find work, uh, the internees were allowed to leave. And so he uh, became a butcher uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, but also started to perform. And he began performing in nightclubs in, in the Midwest. And... Uh, you know, if again you think about what he had to endure, I mean, being a stand-up comic and MC in Cleveland, Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio, Akron, Ohio, right after the war, and that was the reason he changed his name. He actually couldn't get out of the camps as Goto Suzuki, and so he changed his name to Jack Sue. And I actually found the letter where his employer uh, specifically wanted him uh, to be known as a Chinese and not a Japanese because he was afraid. You know, of, that there would be a backlash against his business. And so, uh, Goto took the, uh, first, uh, uh, syllable from his name, Suzuki, and became Jack Sue. Was most of his career as Jack Sue? Were you able to find out what he personally thought of that? What people said is that Jack Sue wasn't bitter about having to. Uh, change his name. I think he, he felt that that was something that he had to do, given his circumstances. And uh, ironically, uh, when he had his first big break, which is in the, the Flower Drum Song, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Flower Drum Song, which is the first Asian American musical, he wanted to change his name back. And he went to the producers and asked them, and they said no for a very 
uh, odd but practical reason. Uh, the two leads in the flower drum song, Miyoshi Umeki and uh, Pat Suzuki, were Japanese. And so they wanted more Chinese in the play because it was a Chinese-themed and based uh, story. And they, they also uh, didn't want another Suzuki to be built since Pat Suzuki was already on the the uh, cast of the, the Broadway play. And so they said no. And so he stayed with the name Jack Sue, and that's the name that he uh, became known by. I'm devoted to my dear old mama, and if you and mama disagree, I would always side with her against you. Snooky, don't marry me. I would always like to know where you go. I don't like a man to keep me in doubt. Honey, that's a thing that's easy to know. You will always know where I am. I'm out. The film also explores the fact that uh, Jack Sue was the first Asian to be featured in as a co-star in a regular TV series. And I, I was surprised to learn that. There was a series called Valentine's Day that was shot in 1963 and was broadcast um, in 1964. And it featured uh, Jack Sue playing a uh, playboy. He, there were these two playboys who were in a publishing uh, the publishing company. The guy, Valentine, was in a publishing company, and they were war buddies who shared an apartment together. It was sort of like The Odd Couple, except you had Tony Franciosa and Jack Sue. And uh, the uh, series uh, was on for, for a year, and so I was able to find some of the footage from that. And it's amazing uh, series, because when you think of most portrayals of Asians, they were either non-existent or... You know, you might think of hot pop singing Bonanza or these very negative caricatures of Asian people. And here you had Jack Sue playing an Asian American. I think his character was born in San Francisco. He was a gambler. He was a hustler. And he played this really cool, almost like Dean Martin-like character. And uh, so the film talks about that. Uh, people who watched a lot of TV in the 70s, like I did, will, will remember Jack Sue from Barney Miller. And it was a it was a, a cop show, a comedy show. And what was unique about Barney Miller is that you had these, uh, you know, the police in the squad room of all different nationalities. There was a Puerto Rican, there was a, uh, you know, two Jewish cops, uh, there was an African American cop, and then there was Jack Sue. And they, they played uh, cops who were who were, uh, um, you know, in this in this police station, and, and the the captain was Barney Miller. And the, the series was, was very popular at that time, and I think ran for six or seven seasons. Um, and uh, sadly, Jack Sue passed away, I think, after the fifth season. And uh, although I haven't seen it, they did a retrospective on the show uh, because his character was so loved and so, uh, I think, respected because of the humor. Jack Sue was known uh, for his deadpan humor. He had this ability to uh, keep a straight face and say the funniest things. Let's listen to this clip from Barney Miller. Call your insurance company. Yeah. Don't mention. Oh, my God, I ate my eraser. And if you go back and look at all of the characters, and this is something that also drew me to him as a person, that he always played these characters that were not only cool, I mean, he would be the kind of person that you would want to spend time with, but also uh, he never gave up his dignity. And I heard that uh, he would never speak in an accent. He refused roles where he would be playing a houseboy or you know, some other subservient role. And in fact, you know, one of the stories that Hal Cantor, who is this fabulous uh, man who's been in television for 50 years, uh, he, uh, I think he's, he's written over the scripts for over 30 uh, Academy Awards. 
but uh, he was the writer and director of Valentine's Day, the show that featured Jack Sue. And he told me that when he met uh, Jack Sue and offered him the role, Jack said no because he thought it was a subservient role. And, it, you know, once he read the script and was convinced that it wasn't, that he would truly be an equal to the other characters in the show, he agreed to do it. Once in my life, I have someone who you Don't Know Jack, the Jack Sue story, will screen at the Asian American International Film Festival on March 15th and the 18th. Visit their website at asianamericanmedia.com. O-R-G. This is Abra Elkier reporting for Apex Express and KPFA. And you are listening to some music we're going to be talking about a little bit later on our calendar from Jonica Selecta. We're going to continue on the movie Tip. As you heard, April has just did uh, something about Jack Suzuki, who is actually a West Oakland boy. A lot of Japanese Americans from this area know Jack Suzuki, born and raised in West Oakland, among a lot of the Japanese American immigrants. We're going to continue on because Yi here has a little bit more information about another sh uh, group of films or a film winner that uh, will be having his stuff shown at the Asian American Film Festival. So um, this person has also gotten very many hits, like 40,000 hits on the YouTube for his documentary. Um, yeah, actually the San Francisco International Film Festival, together with Locust Arts and Kearney Street Workshop, presented the Do-It-Yourself Video Contest that brought together filmmakers and musicians. And on February 20th, the videos were all premiered online and viewers had a chance to vote online for their favorite video. And the director of the music video for the group MUD, Matthew Abaya, is online. Hi, Matthew. Hello, how's it going? Good, good. Um, as Jenna said, the, the hits that you guys got were about 45,000 views in, um, online, and you guys won the, the People's Choice Award. No, that's right. Yeah, and I wanted to... Have have you talk a little bit about just your background in, in film and video and as far as how you ended up working with MUD? Well, I'm uh, actually a film uh, video instructor in uh, East Palo Alto for a group of youth that, uh, that's uh, at Job Train. Uh, sadly, so it's a youth care group, but I studied cinema officially at City College in San Francisco and at SF State, but officially have a major in Asian American Studies. I've uh, done quite a few short films that's been showing at the Asian American Film Festival, but recently I've been more interested in doing a lot more music videos because there seems to be a lot of demand to do it. Mm -hmm. um, as far as getting to work with MUD, um, this is actually something we talked about five years ago, but for some reason didn't come about till really recently, and I was told at the last minute that uh, MUD was in the competition but may, may needed a, a director. I guess they didn't get a director to like the last minute because they called me up and said, Hey, um, we got mud on that wants a, a video, and they gave me a call and said, "Hey, uh, would you be interested in doing it?" And you know, being that I'm a fan of the band, and we talked about it five years ago, I said, "Oh, I'd totally be down with that." Uh, but we only had like a month to really put it together, so it was, the pressure definitely was on for doing it. Mm -hmm. And I know that for the for the other groups, they had about two months, and mm -hmm. you had little or no budget to do this. Um, right. Well, we had a we had a small budget that was put together by the band. It was really small. It was like five hundred dollars, but you know we you know that gave me enough charge to actually put together the the, the necessary equipment to put the video together. But the the band was really generous in helping me with that, and you know I think it it shows in the video. Mm -hmm. And I know this is called the Do It Yourself Video Contest, but I know mm -hmm. you didn't really do it yourself. Um, well, uh, how, how did you? I mean, how did you get all the resources together and all the people together to make it happen? Well, some of the stuff, as a filmmaker, I mean, I actually have access to myself. Also, as an instructor, I can also get it, get, it, uh, get that equipment. Other stuff we had to rent. But a lot of the stuff, like the crew and everything, was everybody was just volunteering their time and helping out because they believed in the project. Sometimes the band themselves actually was involved in a lot of the production itself, too. I mean, they had to lifting all their equipment, setting up almost like they were part of the crew, so it was really a community effort, you know, and I really had some great friends help out with that, you know. So mm -hmm. just, you know, it was a really good team. And as the People's Choice Award winner, your video had more than 45,000 votes. Mm -hmm. how, how were you guys able to do that? 
Oh, Alan, the guitar player, I swear, he's like this real master at like getting thing, getting the word out. I know that they have a little bit of a following. Actually, I shouldn't say a little bit. A pretty big following in Guam, so they mm-hmm. definitely helped out in the hit. But, you know, we just basically hit everybody up, else up, and I guess it was a pretty infectious song. Cause it's every time, everybody who hears the song can't help but sing along with it. So I figure uh, part, of the, part of the success of the video is because Mud is, got, just makes really good, catchy music, and, you know, we just did our best to make the best video to follow up their, their uh, should-have-known video. Mm-hmm. And as far as your inspirations, um, what inspired you to, to make this video as far as... Um in regards to this video and, and as far as your work in general? Um, well, let's see. Um, when I looked at their previous video, it was very bright and colorful, and I know that they're all big fans of horror films, much as I, because I, I've done a lot of horror short films in the festival circuit. And I thought, we are definitely going to at least, I mean, at least aesthetically capture this kind of horror vibe, even though I wouldn't call it necessarily a horror video. And you can see it has this tinge to it that might ring true like in movies like Seven or Saw. And I think we were all really, really in tune with that kind of look for the video. Mm, yeah, I, I actually saw some like some blood and all that in, in parts of the video, right? <laughs> yes, Alan really did cut his hand on the guitar. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, they, he was bleeding, but it wasn't quite as bloody as it shows in the video. We actually enhanced it, not with computer graphics, but we actually... We're pouring blood on top of blood. <laughs> wow. Were there any um, challenges as far as making this video? Well, I think the biggest challenge was just the timeline. You know, we were we, we had so little time to really put it together. And it was like we knew that, we, you know, when Alan came to me and said, we are going to win it, I said, okay, we are. <laughs> uh-huh. And so I said I would definitely put my all into it. So I think it was paid for it mostly and not sleeping a lot. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. <laughs> late nights and stuff. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So you directed it, and did you edit it also? Yeah, um, the credit, like I say, I, I shot, directed, and edited it, mm-hmm. uh, except at one point in the video, we actually had two cameras running to help um, expedite it. So Francis Novero, you know, a good friend of mine and an actor in one of my films, actually took over for a second camera. So we actually had two cameras rolling at one point. Mm-hmm. So it was, he was really helping, and the assistant director... Angelo Ibanez is also, I mean, a, a big contributor to a lot of the artistic side of this video because I was just basically giving him a lot of the ideas and he helped me build all these dolls that, that are streamed throughout the video. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And as the winner, you guys will be at the Music Video Asia. That's okay. right. Um, it's going to be happening on Saturday. Uh, it's going to be happening in the, the Japantown Peace Plaza. It's going to be fun. It's also, the uh, the uh, jury prize winner, uh, Dennis and Kane, directed by mm. Jason Mateo, will also mm-hmm. be screening with it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Do you have any um, contact info f- for listeners that might want to get into contact with you? Yeah, and they can reach me at I don't sorry www.idontcarefilms.com. Also on KPFA, we actually have a MySpace for the API core crew. And if there's information on um, the website for I Don't Care Films for that. Okay, great. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, Matthew, got to say goodbye from the station here. This is KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, and online at www.kpfa.org. If you want to uh, contact Apex Express... Please feel free to do so at this email address. That's apex at kpfa.org, apex at kpfa.org, or you can call us at 510-848-6767, extension 464. Again, that's 510-848-6767, extension 464. And we're going to give out some more contact information in just a little bit. Um, But I did want to continue on with the Asian American Film Festival because there's so much happening. And um, I just want to say thank you so much to you guys out there in CAM, which puts it on, and which is called Center for Asian American Media. Is that right? Yes, that's right. It's formerly known as NASA, and no one has really gotten over the name change, because we're still stuck in that old NASA. Anyways, I just want to say another thing that's premiering is um, the world premiere of Fruit Fly. And the reason I mentioned that is because this person who is the director and filmmaker, H.P. Mendoza, debuted 
In uh, 2006, he came on to Apex Express, and he had a film called, rather, yeah, it was a film called Colma the Musical. Now, Colma the Musical, um, when uh, Protop Chatterjee and I were here doing the show, we go, well, why are we getting, you know, why can't we get a big star? We got somebody who's doing Colma the Musical. Colma, as folks know out here, is where all the dead people get buried. And uh, we go, man, how can you have a musical about Colma? Turns out it became a mini hit. So uh, you, out of all the jazz uh, <laughs> film festivals, this one, Colma the Musical became a hit. And H.P. Mendoza is back with the world premiere of another film he's done called Fruit Fly. And in his films, man, they've got like a lot of different things like dance. It's, it's a little musical. Also, there's going to be um, a festival conversation with Ang Lee and Alex C. And Ang Lee is, as you know, a very famous uh, director. And again, for folks who want to know more about the film festival, which is opening tonight and runs through the 22nd, it's happening all over in Berkeley and in San Francisco, you can go to this, which is www.asianamericanmedia.org. Again, that's asianamericanmedia.org. And in the background, you are listening to music from Monsoon Wedding, which was another big hit. And I do want to continue on with a little bit of music from the streets of Bollywood, just to show folks that, you know, this Bollywood stuff that people used to laugh at, now the music is being picked up by folks all over the world, just a little bit, and this next piece of uh, music you'll hear, they have music from different films in India, one of the films is called Bluff Master, another film is Aisha, and another film is Suten, and this particular track is called Indie Yarn by Trick Baby. So we'll get right back to you after the music, and then more on calendar here on Apex Express. Apex Express with me is Yi. And how are you doing over there listening to this music from Bollywood? I'm good. I'm good. This is like dance music for me. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing what they do with the music. Um, next week, we're going to try and get an interview with some folks in uh, the real slum of Mumbai. Mm -hmm. The real slum of Slumdog Millionaire. It's called Dharavi. And hopefully next week, we're going to get an update about what's happening in that very, actually, vibrant community of M Mumbai here on Apex Express. If you want to contact us, uh, you can also do so by going to APEX at kpfa.org and um, you know we'd love to hear from you we also have a blog spot a blog spot which is triple uh, w apex um, express at wordpress.com and we also have if you want to read more articles 
Um, we have another website, which is apexexpress.org, apexexpress.org. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. This is G. And uh, we didn't have a lot of time for calendar next week, but uh, we definitely want to have it this week. I've gotten a lot of calls for different things that are happening in this area. And this is coming out of Berkeley, California, coming at you. Uh, you have heard about the Asian American Film Festival, but there is another festival that's happening, and it is sponsored by the Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Watch. And there, again, we have a lot of film shorts by youth, and um, some of them are just really um, sound fantastic. One of them is about a young Senegalese girl who was sent to the city to work as a maid in order to support her family, but when her employees begin to abuse her, who is there to protect her? That is one film called School. Another one is about how much do your jeans cost and who made them and how much did they get paid to make them to teenage girl embark on a journey to discover this dark truth and take a stand for change. Now, these are only two of many, many stories put out by um, some of the youth. And these youth are also going to be... Um, part of the uh, Human Rights Film Festival. If you want to know more about it, you can go to this particular um, website, which is humanrightswatch.org. And uh, tomorrow, folks, if you're listening and you have a group that wants to see uh, these particular films by youth, there is a free screening tomorrow, a free screening for youth groups uh, to see these wonderful films, these film shorts. And uh, for information on that, you can go to this uh, site, which is San Francisco YPC at hrw.org. Again, that's San Francisco YPC at hrw.org. And or you can call 415-609-2319. Again, uh, Youth Producing Change is the particular name of this aspect of the Human Rights Watch Film Festival. So again, um, Adobe Youth Voices, Youth Producing Change. And uh, again, be great uh, if you have a chance. Um, please come out and see them. Esther Chang says that, and she is in charge of this particular film festival. Also, Burma Human Rights Day is coming up. That's Saturday the 14th. And there are over 2,000 political prisoners in Burma, and an estimated 3 million people have become displaced by the junta. And some of the speakers that are going to be featured is Min Zin, who is a Burmese journalist in exile, and Zoya Fan, who is um, from uh, the Karin people in Burma, and she's going to be talking about what happened to her folks uh, when the military attacked her village in Burma. Again, this event is Saturday, March the 14th, at uh, 6 to 10 p.m. at the Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalist Hall. That is a darn long name. The Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalist Hall. And for more information, you can go to www.badasf.org. Again, that's badasf.org for more information on this Burma Human Rights Day. Also, if you want to intern for President Obama today, President, or rather, not today, uh, President Obama recently launched uh, a White House internship program for folks who are interested, and applications are currently being accepted for the summer of this year. And in addition to normal office duties, interns will supplement their learning experience by attending weekly lecture series hosted by senior White House staff, and you'll also be able to help out at many events at the White House. Um, it runs from May 22nd to August the 14th. And for more information, you can go to www.whitehouse.gov slash about slash internships. And um, I do want to play, while we go out, uh, some more music by Jonica Selecta. Jonica Selecta is a... Um, DJ who's been around for a long time, formerly of uh, Damal. He is now presenting. He's part of the um, group. Um, it's not really a group, but it's, it's part of the, the Dub V Sound System featuring Jonica. And they're going to be playing very, very soon at um, the Elbow Room in Valencia Street, on Valencia Street in San Francisco. For more information, you can go to www.dubmissionsf.com. That's www.dubmissionsf.com. And I'd like to play some tracks from Jonica, who sent it over to here 
on Apex Express. His new CD is called Pushing Air, Pushing Air, and、uh, Jonica's music is a real mix of the worlds that he's been in. He was born in Sri Lanka, he was raised in the UK and in Kuwait, and he's now residing in San Francisco. And believe me, his music sounds like all of the above.、Um, he's part of the global dance music scene, and a lot of his work has been presented in the UK as well as in the US. And he's done mixes with Kar Sale and Chevy Saba. So let's listen to some music from his Pushing Air CD, Jonica Selecta. Apex Express. My name is G here on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KSBF in Fresno. And don't forget to listen to everybody at kpfa.org. You can go to past programs, and it goes back several years. So all you have to do is just look in the, the past listings.、Um, and、uh, yeah, you can hear many, many shows in the past. It's 7:57, and before we go out here at Apex Express, we got one more announcement from Yi. Yes, 40 years ago, the Third World Liberation Front took place on the UC Berkeley campus. This week, there's a whole list of events, and this weekend,、um, as part of it, is the API Issues Conference from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Burroughs Hall. And the keynote speakers are actually Yuri Kochiyama and Helen Zia. And I think there's a, a website on it, which is www.activistinterested.com, something like that. Activism right here. There.com. Activismrightthere.com for more information. So stay tuned now for the Bonnie Simmons Show. This is Apex Express, and we are now podcasting. It's podcastable, so you can check us out if you go to www.apex-express.org. Thanks, and stay tuned for the Bonnie Simmons Show. We're going to go out with our friends, Asian Crisis.